during his presidentship in second AOG SBJ conference. He's a very, he's a great organizer and has organized many academic come pleasure trips abroad. And I'm really happy to share that we were included in many of these international academic exchange program. And he's the one who is, a promote, who is promoting aesthetic gynecology and making all of us aware how to deal with such females. And I'm sure we will witness a wonderful and very uh, informative uh, deliberation today. So welcome, sir, once again. I also want to welcome our chairpersons, Dr. Sumati from Madurai, Dr. Chitra from Coimbatore to this webinar. And finally, I would like to welcome our convener, Dr. Priyankur Roy, who is always there to help us. So now I hand over the session to Dr. Priyankur. Please carry forward. Once again, a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Me. Pratiba, and best wishes for all your uh, webinar series. Thank you. Okay, Thank nice you to much. see that Bhagalpur is doing so much of academic work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, first of all, we have this exciting quiz series that keeps happening with us. So we had a surprise quiz that we uh, had uh, 14 days back in the last third episode of the program. So uh, I would first of all like to uh, wish and congratulate the winners of the prizes of the last week. So first, if we look at the question, which of the following is not a part of adult treatment uh, the, the panel criteria three for metabolic syndrome. So there were four options, waist, waist circumference more than 88 centimeter, high density uh, lipoprotein, uh, which is uh, less than 50 milligram per deciliter, triglycerides more than 150 milligram per deciliter, and BMI more than 25 kg per meter square. So correct answers were re re received within fraction of seconds. And of course, we know that the correct answer was BMI more than 25 kg per meter square. So the winners of uh, the prizes, uh, let, let, it gives me immense pleasure to uh, for, uh, announce the prizes. So the third prize, uh, sorry, the, the first prize was goes to, I'm sorry, Dr. Sumati from uh, Perambalur. And she wins the prize and she wins uh, a book on polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, this is a Medifocus, Medifocus guidebook on it. So congratulations, Dr. Sumati, for uh, winning the prize for the surprise quiz that was held on the 18th of uh, February. Congratulations to you. So along with her, we also have uh, certificates of appreciation with few, for few other participants who received the prizes and who had answered uh, it correctly. So first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Khalida Huda from Patna, Doc, Dr. Bhavya from Uti, Dr. Uma Devi from Secunderabad and Dr. Sri Devi from, from Tamil Nadu. So congratulations to all the winners. And it gives us really this, the, the quick answers from, from participants really keeps us going. And we really get excited about this, uh, this quiz competition that we do it every time. So congratulations to all the winners. Now we had a exciting Know Your Legend quiz that we do every week. Uh, the, the, before the program happens. So this time too, we had a similar quiz that uh, we had uh, conducted and we had put in the questions in the various groups. Can, we, can I have the uh, slide please? So this was the, the Know Your Legend quiz that was put up and the correct answer was Dr. Alexander Bader. He is an internationally renowned OBGYN specialist and cosmetic gynecologist who pioneered in cosmetic vaginal surgery in Europe and is the first doctor on the continent, continent to exclusively practice CVS. So I would like to announce the names of the prizes or the prize winners as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So uh, the the prize winners are the first. Uh, the first prize uh, goes to Dr. Kaushal, Dr. Kaushal Patel from Valsat. He wins a book on the practical tips of infertility management, which is from our chief, written by the edit, the editor is our chief guest, Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra, ma'am. The next prize, the second prize winner. We have two second prizes. Yeah, there are a couple of second prizes. One is Dr. Sureka Taide from Varda, and she wins a book on the FEQs on stem cell, urogynecology, and gestational diabetes. Again, a uh, 
so one of the series whose editor is our chief guest dr jaydeep malhotra the next next one yeah this is another second prize which has gone to dr vasundhara lal from bhagalpur so congratulations to you to ma'am dr vasundhara and the third prize uh, winner is dr geeta shri and she is from bangalore so congratulations dr geeta shri she also wins a faq on adolescent infertility and menopause that has the series convener or the series editor is again jaydeep malhotra ma'am so it gives me immense pleasure to inform all of you that the total entries that were there were 112 out of that the correct answers was 94 and the wrong answers were 18 So congratulations to all the winners. A certificate of Now, appreciation also is entered. Yeah. So we had a certificate of appreciation that was to be given to all the participants who answered the answer fastest, and we have fifteen of them whom we have selected for this uh, category. So, Dr. Shubhangi. These are the these are the two people who have answered consistently these quiz uh, for okay. the four four times correctly. Yes, Dr. so we are going for the consistent prize winners first. So, Dr. Shubhangi Mundada from Amravati. Doctor, uh, next one, please. Dr. Minakshi Kumari from Rachi. So, they get a book on Foxianism, and these are the prize winners who have cons consistently sent in the answers, and they have correctly answered it for the last four quizzes. And congratulations to the winners. So, can I have the next one, please? so we had another uh, another five people who also had consistently put in their prizes their answers dr lalita from hyderabad dr chitra gupta from jalandhar dr manju jaiswal from muzaffarpur dr deepti uh, dokri mare from bandra dr kiran jaiswal from godda Dr. Abharani Sina from Patna. Dr. Rita Chaudhary from Patna. Dr. Suruchi Smriti from Motihari. And we had an entry from California Sanjos Sanjos as well. Dr. Shashwati Kale was the was another one of the fastest finger first for the quiz that was on the twentieth of February. Congratulations to her too. Next one, please. Dr. Apurva Datta. Uh, from Dhanbad, so congratulations, Apurva. Dr. Yukti Bharadwaj from Delhi, congratulations, ma'am. Dr. Pratiba Mangotra from Jalandhar, congratulations, Dr. Pratiba. Dr. Monica Dev from Silchar. Dr. Jyoti Chaudhary from Bhagalpur. That's all. That's all. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much uh, for all the participants for participating so actively. and winning prizes and consistently um, answering the prizes so that that shows us the sort of interest that is there in this uh, sort of event that we are conducting so congratulations to all of you so now before we move on to the academic session we have a chief guest with us can i have the cv slide of ma'am please so it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, jaydeep ma'am uh, Uh, she is of course uh, everyone knows ma'am ma'am is the director of the art rainbow ibf she is uh, a lady who is associated with most of the associations not only in india but worldwide as well and has held important positions in most of the uh, most of the um, uh, most of the organizations so she has been a past president of foxy she has been a past president of the uh, she is a uh, president of the south asian federation of menopause societies immediate past president of isar past president of aspire and ims as well and she is also the she is the editor in chief of safog and safoms journal and many other books as well she has been a past vice chairman of icog so it gives me immense pleasure now to welcome ma'am to this platform to tell to bless all of us for this program and also kindly to felicitate the winners of the quiz competition that we had ma'am so over to you ma'am please thank you thank you priyankur and uh, thanks pratibha uh, for this very very kind invitation and uh, this is a wonderful wonderful friendship and relationship we, which we both of us have shared with you and uh, most of the people who are there um i'm so happy to see you know a program doing so well and so well thought of 
and uh, you know one of on one of the latest new buzzwords which are which is there in the field of medicine that's the uh, aesthetic and regenerative uh, gynecology and i i'm sure that everyone wants to look beautiful every day i don't know how many phone calls come uh, on what can we do and and i just wanted to say that this is such an exciting branch so looking good is not the only potential use of aesthetic and regenerative uh, medicine because there, there's so much to do in this field and you would be really shocked and amazed at the wide horizons and the spectrum of the potential uses of uh, regenerative uh, medicine because when we are talking about gynecology yes gynecologists are ahead of uh, most of the branches but i am sure this branch uh involves a lot of other disciplines also and we are actually looking at not only looking beautiful we are looking at repair we are looking at replacement we are looking at regeneration of the tissues and the organ restoration now sky is a limit to what we have in our bag here we have cell therapies we have like tissue engineering gene therapy biomedical engineering and, and unbelievable uh, scope uh, to be used everywhere right from face to the bottom you can actually you know make use of uh, this regenerative medicine but what is really important the quality of life is something which i would really urge all of you because this is one branch where we focus on the quality of life and that probably when once the aging starts Uh, we need to really you know look after ourselves and it's not only when you have reached your 50s and 60s and then you're looking at i think it's a constant process of prevention and regeneration and that balance needs to be maintained and i'm sure today with this wonderful uh, speakers you have most of them are you know uh, dear dear friends who are working and very passionate in this field i'm sure you're going to do a great job and this is going to be a wonderful learning uh, experience for all of us uh, i have to congratulate ragini shilamane who are, you know our guest of honor for this program for being there and uh, preeti who is the secretary uh, general of insarch because i happen to be also part and parcel of that organization and congratulations narin for putting this program up because i think uh, everyone is inquisitive about what is happening in this field and today i think we are going to have a trailer of that and many young people who are there uh, my heartiest congratulations to all the winners i think this is the first program if i am not mistaken priyankur i may be wrong totally but with such immense participation for the quiz i have not noticed it in any other program so it speaks a lot about the organizers and uh, congratulations to shield for you know organizing and uh, doing this wonderful connect uh, knowledge update program so all the best and i'm looking forward to a great great updating program thank you so much for having me thank you thank you audible ma'am am i audible now ah yeah now yeah, no. yeah so yeah. ma'am i i wanted to say wherever you go whichever program you go you pump in a lot of energy into it so thank you so much ma'am for being with us today evening jaydeep ma'am and uh, and the i'm very sure the congratulatory message from you means a lot to all the prize winners who are present here today evening and thank you so very much for being with us today evening ma'am thank you so uh, moving on next uh, i would like to invite our uh, guest of honor can i have the cv slide of ma'am please yeah so our, our uh, guest of honor is dr ragini agarwal ma'am she is uh, a vice president of foxy founder of the gurgaon obgyn society founder president of the hard obgyn society that is the uh, association of the obstetrics and gynecologists of haryana founder president elect of the aesthetic and regenerative society of india insar 
founder committee chairperson of the aesthetic health of IMS, which I am also a, a part of it, ma'am, uh, included me, and thank you so much for that, ma'am. President of the Indian Academy of the Cosmetic Gynecology and Dermatology. So I welcome ma'am to this platform and I request a few words of blessings from you, ma'am. And I would also like you to uh, uh, request you to kindly felicitate our consistent uh, prize winners so who have answered consistently for all the for the last four seasons, ma'am. So over to you, Ragin, ma'am. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you for your kind words and Pratibha for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. And it's such a wonderful place to be here. Uh, although I was not able to visit the Bhagalpur, but I feel like that I am in the Bhagalpur. And uh, uh, with the Dr. Malhotras, the powerful, most adorable couple of the Foxy, GM and NM, uh, sharing a dais is a really an honor. And with dear Finn, uh, Sheila, and we have all stalwarts who are uh, working in the field of uh, cosmetic gynecology, Savana, Preeti, and um, Surakshit, along with our Eurogyne international star, Aparna, who is not only a doctor par excellence, and she is working for the community also. Dr. Emily, although I have never met you, but uh, yes, always there's a first time to meet everyone and the dear delegates. Today's topic is no doubt a very, very different topic as Dr. Jadeep has uh, covered the basic and the most important points, specifically the quality of life. When we talk about the cosmetic gynecology or aesthetic gynecology, it is not only about the beauty. It is something which gives a woman a quality of life because without it, she's suffering in many, many ways. And what I call the uh, cosmetic gynecology, it is the fourth dimension of the medical aesthetics, which is started from the face to the correction of the body and ultimately came to the intimate health. And the topic heading is very, very apt. The changing scenario of the cosmetic gynecology. I remember I have given a talk on the same title almost four years back when we started this uh, uh, many meetings on the cosmetic gynecology was started in India. We all know that it is nothing new. We are doing it since ages, almost 25 years we are doing the surgical things. But what is changed today is the perception and the training and the availability. And for that, what is there is the energy-based devices. When they came in the market, they have changed the phase from the surgical to non-surgical and not only the operations. What we have is a real thing, is a regeneration. And that's why this is a speciality which is not only aesthetic, it is a regenerative gynecology. And when we talk about the menopausal women specifically, this regeneration is more important than any surgery. Until unless there's a remodelation of the vaginal epithelium and everything, which we are going to listen in detail from Savana uh, in the debate, when she will have a debate with the Aparna, why we need a non-surgical thing. Yes, it is in a controversy because of the FDA. But believe me, friends, with uh, whatever we are doing, a little bit in it, we are quite happy in cases where it is really indicated, specifically in the menopausal women. So not uh, going to stand between you and academic feast. Again, I will congratulate all the winners who have got this prizes and the uh, Pratibha who has thought of something really out of box to involve each and everyone who are attending this thing. Thank you so much again. Over to you, Priyankar. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much, ma'am, for joining us and blessing this session. Thank you, ma'am. So now, uh, moving on. What is the felicitation? Like... You are to do, going to do some felicitation for someone or at the end? Ma'am, the prize winners which we have announced, we just okay, wanted a congratulatory okay. message from you for them. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So now moving on, I would like to invite uh, the special guest of uh, today's evening, Dr. Sheila Mane, ma'am. Again, a very senior uh, person, a person whom I was uh, personally uh, working when I was a, a postgraduate student and ma'am was the vice president of Foxy and we had done the Yuva Foxy, uh, Yuva Foxy in Mysore uh, under the chairmanship of my professor, Dr. Amrish Bandiwar. 
so uh, ma'am uh, she uh, everyone knows ma'am she is the, she was organizing secretary of aicot 2003 and 2019 vice president of oxy in 2014 chairperson past chairperson of the safe motherhood committee national coordinator of pph workshops rather many pph workshops workshops i should mention over here she is icog governing council member and she is a Thank corresponding you. editor of the our prestigious jogi journal so it gives me immense pleasure to welcome ma'am uh, to this platform and request a few words of blessings to uh, blessings to, for our program uh, thank you thank you priyanku for those uh, kind words and it's nice to see, nice to see you coordinating so nicely all the programs and uh, as dr jaydeep and dr ragini mentioned about the quiz and the participation uh, of people with so much of ent enthusiasm that itself shows the interest gaining in these subjects i must say that these type of webinars and associations which, which have started have really sensitized the gynecologists now all over the country and i think that will really help to spread the message more and more because as dr jaydeep malhotra said the quality of life and ragini said that it is regenerative you know it is very simple and but we have to spread the message the first the message should go to the gynecologist you know you have to convince the gynecologist that it works and that will at the end of the day is going to help to improve the quality of life and i think that is what we want because we know the life expectancy of the woman has increased by one third and when we say that we want her to be uh, fit at 40 strong at 60 independent at 80 and sophisticated at 90 okay i think all these things will really add to this so she will really really have a very good quality of life and now the main thing is that as there is a, a, a news now that women know women know whom to approach and where to go earlier i think they would just suffer and they had learned to live with their problems so i must congratulate again dr pratibha from bagalpur and the whole team of faculty for participating in this and spreading the awareness of knowledge so i again once again i would like to uh, heartily congratulate everybody here soana aparna hegde chitra and everybody all the faculty members for participating in this very useful webinar and thanks once again for inviting me for this webinar as a special guest thank you namaste thank you madam thank you madam Thank Thank you, you, you so so very much, uh, Sheila, ma'am, for those wonderful words. And I would really like to congratulate Pratibha, ma'am, and all the participants who have participated in the quiz because ultimate winners are all the participants. It's it's definitely that we have to select a few winners, but then everyone, every participant is a winner. so uh, congratulations to all of you and congratulations pratibha ma'am for thinking out of the book and uh, for, uh, conducting this quiz week after week congratulations ma'am to you too thank you thank you so, so now we have a exciting uh, session that is uh, a talk on our know your legend quiz dr alexander bader and it will be given uh, the or the talk will be delivered by one of the winners that is how we do it every week so this uh, time the the part the talk will be given by dr geeta shri from bangalore yeah so dr geeta shri she uh, so uh, over to you dr geeta shri and i would request you to kindly speak on dr alexander but so dr geeta shri is a assistant professor at the rr mch in bangalore thank you dr priyanku a uh, good evening uh, to everyone it is my great pleasure and to introduce an eminent personality in the field of cosmetic gynecology uh, dr alexander bader he is internationally renowned specialist in the obgyn and cosmetic gynecologist who pioneered cosmetic vaginal surgeries in europe and has more than 22 years of experience dr bader is also founder of bader medical institute of london and is frequently conducts hands on training courses and holds position in the president of european society of aesthetic gynecology he is regularly invited to lecture and teach at international meetings in cosmetic surgery and as more than 3000 procedures being done on the uh, cosmetic gynecologies he did this uh, okay. medicine from halama yes, i can you make it a slide show slide show ah, yeah yeah sure ma'am yeah. yeah 
he did his medicine from the university of inonia from greece and the maternity clinic from the university of venezuelas and is also a fellow of american academy of cosmetic gynecologists and international society of cosmetic gynecologists coming to his special interest his special interest lies in the medical mm -hmm. procedures like botox injections cosmetic gynecology pelvic floor surgery pessaries pubic vaginal slings relaxation technique vaginal re uh, reconstruction laser vaginal rejuvenation labioplasty vaginal tightening clitoral hoodectomy vaginal bleaching g spot enhancement and liposuction he has been awarded with various prizes being the best labial during the aesthetic show 2016 las vegas and also award of uh, teaching excellence at cosmetic gynecology 2016 and also recently award of contribution on the co cosmetic and aesthetic gynecology 2017 thank you dr pratibha madam for giving me this opportunity to be able to present this thank you for the knowledge update series madam over to you dr Pr priyankur congratulations dr geeta for winning third prize Congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Geeta, and thank you so much for enlightening us about our uh, Know Your Legend quiz. Thank you so much. So now uh, we move on to the uh, second session, that is the uh, session two, and we will have an exciting debate uh, that is waiting for us. So to judge this debate, we have uh, two eminent faculties. Uh, who are there among us uh, can i have the cv slide please yeah so first of all it's dr surakshit batina a very good friend of mine he's a consultant endoscopic surgeon reproductive medicine specialist and cosmetic gynecologist at the indigo women's hospital in chennai he has a number of degrees to his credit and he has uh, at, at, uh, published a number of papers in many journals and also attended a number of conferences as faculty. So welcome Surakshit to this platform. It gives, me, gives us immense privilege and pleasure to have you with us today. The next judge we have with us is Dr. Emily. Dr. Emily is a very good friend of mine. We were working together in CMC Valor maybe 10 years uh, down the line. And she is currently the Associate Professor of the Department OBGYN at CMC Velo. She heads the Urogynecological Department in CMC Velo. She has received a number of awards, including the Best Diploma Student in Obstetrics and Gynecology, Best in, Student in MS Obstetrics and Gynecology, and also the Best Paper Written by a Second Year Medical Student, in, uh, which is a very important award in uh, CMC Velo. She has the un, uh, undergoing a, a number of research projects, uh, uh, which, uh, of course, as a PG guide, she's, do, uh, she's uh, a guide for them. And then uh, welcome, Emily, to this platform. And I congratulate you for, for such a wonderful uh, uh, CV. So congratulations, Emily, and welcome. We also have an expert uh, with us today. And the expert opinion will be Dr. Preeti Jindal. So ma'am is uh, the director of the Touch Clinic in Mohali. Senior Consultant Gynecologist and IVF Specialist and Cosmetic Gynecologist. She is currently the President of the Mohali Obstetrics and Gynecological Society and also the General Secretary of INSAG. She is a Senior Consultant Gynecologist at Portis Hospital Mohali as well as the Healing Touch Hospital yeah, in China. She has received a number of awards and uh, also has published a number of papers in various uh, national and international journals. I welcome our judges as well as the expert. And now I would request Dr. Surakshit to kindly introduce our first speaker, Dr. Aparna Hegre, and ma'am will be, uh, the topic for the debate is surgical versus non-surgical management of SUI, SUI and uh, it's a debate between Dr. Aparna and Dr. Savanna. So I would request Dr. Surakshit to kindly introduce Dr. Aparna first. Yeah. Uh, can I have Dr. Aparna CV, please? <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pratibha for giving me the opportunity to be here today. And um, it's this uh, fantastic new field. Everyone is uh, talking about it. I think cosmetic gynecology is here to stay. Uh, I'm one of the few lucky ones to have gone to uh, UK to train with Dr. Bader. So I am actually very well uh, known to Dr. Bader, Alex, and as well as uh, I also trained under him. So definitely, I think we have a lot of knowledge we can share today. So can we have uh, the CV, please? Yeah. So Dr. Aparna, she is uh, finished her MS uh, of urogynecology in the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. She's an associate professor of urogynecology, Kana Hospital and Grand Medical College in Mumbai, founder and director of the Center of Urogynecology and Pelvic Health in New Delhi. 
consultant urogynecologist in the Global Hospital in Surya Hospital, as well as Women's Hospital in Mumbai. Um, and also she's a member and editorial board of several journals. So uh, welcome Dr. Aparna. And I would like to hand over to Dr. Amiti to introduce our next speaker. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pratibha and um, Priyankur, my friend, and uh, all the others around here. It gives me a great, uh, it's a great privilege to be here with you all uh, this evening, even though I, you may not know me much, but it's uh, nice to be in the presence of so many eminent um, surgeons and speakers. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Savana Chongtam. She's an alumni of the Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, and a senior gynecologist and feminine aesthetic surgeon. She received vaginal aesthetic training from European Society of Aesthetic Gynecology, London, surgical aesthetics from Israel, and non-surgical aesthetics from Spain. And with a vision to provide 360-degree healthcare, she founded Savannah's um, she Matters Women's Clinic at Delhi and Imphal, and subsequently Savannah's SM Academy of Feminine Health at Manipur. She, uh, from her CV and from what I have heard about her and read about her, she seems to be a very dynamic um, and a proactive person, and I, I'm uh, privileged to welcome her. Thank you, uh, Surakshit and uh, Emily. Now I would request Dr. Aparna to kindly uh, share her screen and go ahead with her talk, please. So the debate will be Dr. Aparna will be speaking first, followed by Dr. Savanna, and then Dr. Aparna will get a minute to for the rebuttal, and then we'll have the comments from Dr. Emily, Dr. Surakshit, as well as our expert, Dr. Preet. So over to you, Aparna, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the debate has been structured as surgical versus non-surgical. But actually, for me, the debate is not that, you know? The debate is between two different non-surgical treatments, actually, because it's well known that uh, aesthetic sources like laser does not work in severe SUI. There is no uh, you know, evidence backing it. Um, uh, and there's no research being done as of now on severe SUI. So let's look at what helps in mild and moderate SUI, right? And then I'll go on to when I would go in for surgery, because as a urogynecologist, I don't go on to operate the patient immediately. No, but there are other tools that I use in 70% of my patients. Uh, with no invasion, because even laser is invasive. You know, you're doing modifying the collagen there. You're doing a lot of stuff there, which changing the tissue caliber. And I have seen patients coming back with complications when I trained in the United States, um, you know, uh, uh, in urogynecology. So what do I offer, right? I'm going to tell you that, right? So obviously I start off SUI management, a lot of lifestyle modification. All of us know this and everybody would do this. It would say weight reduction, stop smoking, fluid management, we would say, uh, you know, uh, treat chronic cough and UTI. And of course, we'll also give estrogen therapy. All of us are, you know, uh, in cohorts here. However, the one thing that I really think needs to become even more famous than laser and which helps 70% of patients is pelvic floor muscle training, right? And it really, really works beautifully in my practice, right? So what do I do, right? So why does pelvic floor muscle training is first line according to every research uh, paper here you will read, right? If you look at Cochrane, etc., right? So what happens is that your levodynamic muscles is made up of two types of fibers, right? Type one and type two, and you need to really strengthen that, irrespective of whatever therapy you do after that, right? Because it's the weakness of those muscles that's leading to SUI, right? So I would strengthen type one fibers through regular strength training, increase stiffness and structural support of the pelvic floor, so that that's increased strength overall. And I was also strengthened type two fibers. By per, uh, and why do I strengthen type two fibers? Because these are the quick contraction fibers and they help uh, once they're strengthened uh, to uh, uh, you know, take care of mild and moderate SUI very well because the woman is trained to do bracing or performing the knack. And once her type two fibers are strengthened, just before she coughs, laughs, sneezes, et cetera, she learns to con consciously contract her, type, her pelvic floor muscles, right? And then over time, it becomes subconscious. And then she's able to take care of herself, right? So 70% of patients don't require more than this, right? And there are, all of us know that, you know, we call it Kegels. Uh, and then there are multiple number of, you know, exercises you can do, right? You can do it from 12 uh, contractions three times a day to 200 contractions per day. Duration of contraction may be from four to 30, 40 seconds. And duration of treatment may go from one week to six months, commonly three months. But the thing is this, that 70, uh, like 50% of patients cannot identify pelvic floor muscles, right? Uh, and... Uh, in fact, 27% uh, of patients will do reverse Kegel, right? You ask them to contract, they're pushing away. And that's where this is the magic portion, right? Biofeedback. 
and in my practice 70% do well only with this non invasive completely right uh, uh, so this is really non surgical right so what is biofeedback now when i ask you to contract your pelvic floor you won't be able to identify the mismatches you're contracting you don't even know what you're doing right i have patients coming back a year later they say they're doing kegel but they aren't really exercising properly in biofeedback i have a probe that goes in the vagina and the she squeezes around it right and i can see on the computer how well she is squeezing and then i can give her homework right so this is biofeedback right and biofeedback helps to reinforce pelvic floor muscle re recruitment reinforces bladder inhibition and alters pathophysiological responses right so this is the one i use it's called maple very important it should, it should be introduced through the country this is a 24 electrode probe that goes in the vagina and i get the entire muscle uh, of the pelvic floor as a grid can you see that the beautiful grid that you are seeing and when i see the grid i can actually compare her muscle strength to a reference group so if the if the muscles are you know red it means she's you know uh, when she's contracting means she's got good contraction it's blue it means she's got poor contraction right so now when a patient comes to me and they're undergoing biofeedback what do i do right i take them through it they come once a week for 10 sittings just 10 sittings it's cheaper right one sitting is not too much, even 2000 rupees right they come to me uh, i will look at rest how they are then i will do three maximum voluntary contraction become looking at the uh, ability of the type 2 fibers you see the middle grid the middle grid is type 2 and and she's seeing how well she's contracting so i'm going to take her through three 10 contractions like that quick contraction quick relaxation then i'm going to do endurance right so how what do i do i'll ask them to contract and hold for 10 to 15 seconds and then i'll see how long she can hold how many seconds she can hold uh, i mean how many times she can hold right when i do this what do i get right as i told you i have i can compare her muscles to a reference group and when she is contracting if her you know she contracting really well then the grid if you see here clearly it's going red i can see actually which muscle she is able to contract and how well and here in this patient you can clearly see that no matter how much i making a contract it remains blue that means she's got weak muscles there right and i build it up over time right so i get a grid like this this at rest after 10 contractions i'm getting at rest maximum voluntary contraction and endurance right so what have i done with this i have showed her which muscles to contract i sit with her to help her identify the muscles she goes back and practices right at home she will go back and the thing is this you can't just tell a woman to contract 10 second hold 10 second relax 10 times because it's like crossing a dead horse if you can't even hold for 2 seconds it's not just enough to be able to contract but you're supposed to hold and in here i can understand how long she's holding and i'm going to give her uh, a training uh, a homework where she will practice three times a day you know she'll get up in the morning go to the bathroom come back sit down contract her pelvic floor without contracting abdominal muscles not like yoga where you contract everything up right you're supposed to isolate pelvic floor i was taught her how to do that using biofeedback and she'll uh, uh, you know suppose she in my lab could only contract 5 seconds five times then she will do 2 seconds more than she could do two times more than she could do so 7 second hold 7 second relax seven times half an hour break then 2 second hold 2 second relax seven times right three times a day right and then she seeing her how she's going next week she comes back when she comes back next week i again put her through the whole thing and then i can look at her average emg and peak emg and she is with me seeing how well she's improving over time and believe me 10 sittings of this This is look at this patient, right? This patient couldn't contract at all in the first visit. Look at the next visit. How beautifully she could contract. Why would you do an invasive therapy for a patient when something like this works beautifully well, right? And in the same sitting, when she comes, I will also do electrical stimulation. So I do biofeedback. And once I finish my feedback, in the same sitting, she'll undergo electrical stimulation. How, what do I do now? Uh, the beautiful thing about this is 24 electrodes now if you look at this particular grid right in the maximum voluntary contraction everything was blue right so i knew all her muscles are weak i can actually stimulate i can decide which muscles i want to stimulate for example in the endurance grid the inner grid is red and the outer is blue so i can decide i want to only do electrical stimulation of the blue muscles right and then so weekly she will undergo electrical stimulation i can choose what i want to do and for sui patient i would use 50 hertz urgency incontinence patients i would use 20 hertz and mixed incontinence 12 hertz so they differ right in what kind of you know uh, frequency i would use and i could choose which uh, you know ring to you choose or either i just want to con you know exercise her pelvic uh, you know anterior and posterior fibers and not the lateral ones so i can choose the grid i want to stimulate right and use different frequencies and cochrane backs this right everywhere you go anywhere and in my practice i follow evidence it's extremely important to follow evidence because when you go to court of law what backs you is evidence 
not what we feel, not our experience, not what my seniors have taught me, but evidence. And Cochrane clearly, clearly, clearly says, first line management is pelvic floor muscle training, but if they can't identify the pelvic floor, biofeedback and electrical stimulation. It's the law, literally, according to our guidelines. And Cochrane, I mean, if you go through this evidence, it's really beautifully done, right? So I would really encourage all of you to go and read the Cochrane review. It says, this is first line treatment. And this is really the non-surgical treatment. Now, if a patient, and my practice, mild to moderate, this works beautifully. I have done this, so why would I go into laser in her? I don't need to do that, right? Then severe, right? Only patients with severe SUI, and I can vouch for that, and they will not be helped by your laser. So next line after, after a pelvic or muscle training using biofeedback is not laser, it is surgery. Why? Long-standing evidence. And I'm not talking about trans a sling. Very important because trans, all the noise in UK, in Australia, in Canada is against trans obturator. Please read the fine print. Eurogynes like me do trans vaginal tape, retropubic tape, right? Even in the UK, what's going to come back is trans vaginal retropubic tape. It's not TOT. So I never really, I do ultrasound work where I can see how the slings are placed. And it's very clear for me that if I really want to do surgical uh, treatment, I would do transvaginal tape, retropubic tape, right? And those I will do only if conservative treatment therapy is failed. And that's in severe incontinence. I have not come across a single patient who sat across me and told me, Madam, I don't want you to do non-invasive therapy. I want you to go and do invasive laser or surgical therapy, right? So I would obviously do biofeedback first and then go on to surgical therapy, right? And surgical therapies, you know, all along, people have said, oh, TOT is the easiest, TOT is the easiest. No, I'm coming here to bat for transvaginal tape, retropubic, which is where the evidence lies. Let's go through all the surgical therapies, right? Birch. Now, Birch is coming back. Birch is great in patients who don't have severe ISD, intrinsic sphincter deficiency, right? Where That's where Birch uh, will not work. You should never do Birch uh, in ISD patients, intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Why? Because it's bladder. It keeps the bladder neck open. It makes your, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, proximal urethra and abdominal structure. But laser has absolutely no therapy for intrinsic sphincter deficiency. No one has even tried it in intrinsic sphincter deficiency, right? What do you do? Retropubic sling, TVT sling, right? Or pubovaginal sling, right? So you could put when you have an ISD patient, uh, like severe sphincter deficiency patient, I would put the same tape but a little bit of bladder neck, right? Why? Because you want to support the sphincter, correct? So as urogynecologists, we're trained to understand which patient has got ISD, in which patient to do more tensioning, and which patient you might want to put a little bit of bladder neck, right? Because you want to support the urethra and you want to support the sphincter for which your laser does not have any, uh, you know, uh, therapies in severe ISD patients. The, you know, the, the, but the one winner for me is TVT tape, right? Not TOT. Retropubic, both retropubic and TOT, what do they do, right? They are replacing the pubo-urethral ligaments at the bladder uh, mid urethra right? Now, look at the evidence. This is what, you know, I mean, in today's litigation age, I want to have evidence that's lasting for eight years, 10 years, 17 years. And it's clear, mid urethral synthetic sling inserted by the retropubic root has higher objective patient reported cure rates is eight years. It is clear. I mean, there's no more debate there, right? And yes, and look at this, right? Look at the num a number of years of evidence. 11 years evidence from Iceland. This is a beautiful paper. It came from Nielsen et al. They followed up the same group of patients for 11 years, right? And then, uh, and the same group of patients for 17 years. And look at the results, right? 90% objectively continent and 87% subjectively cured or significantly improved, correct? After 17 years, when I have a young girl coming to me, right? who comes with leaking of urine. What would I want to put for her? I want to put for her something that I know and has got evidence backing is long uh, lasting forever. What is it first? Pelvic muscle training. If that doesn't work, TBT, 17 years. Why? Because I know TBT will even work with uh, ISD. A woman who comes with hypermobility SUI at 20 years of age or 25 years of age might develop. Remember one thing, SUI is a progressive disease, okay? Uh, uh, she, it's not as if you've done your therapy laser or whatever. It's not going to progress because 50 years later, she might have sphincter deficiency. So what are you going to do? I would like to put something and take care of everything. First is pelvic muscle stra strengthening and then uh, TVT string, right? Because it will later on work even if she develops a progressive disease in SUI. 
what will you do if a patient develops a, you know progressive disease right i mean i have gone done collagen you know strengthening uh, i mean whatever uh, you know you do with laser but it can't take care of sphincter right you have to go back and do therapy later on right so this this will take care of forever once and for all right but the thing that you must understand the evidence all over is very poor for isd and mixing continence patients right in the garden variety sui both tot and tvt have the same or similar outcomes but in isd please understand this is where the urogyn is so important because you know the isd uh, you have to look at the reoperation rates right so there is evidence coming out right what are the long term consequence the long term consequence tvt has the least long term repeat surgery uh, you know outcomes right so that's why i would do a tvt and we talk about complication rate like everybody talks about oh retropubic sling complication retropubic sling complication not really true you know we as you know agynax all of us going all of us been working in the retropubic area all our lives right all of us know retropubic area right gynax so in this area why is anybody scared of this this area this is retropubic area retropubic area tomorrow the problem i can go in even uh, i mean uh, you can go in the open surgery you can go in the laparoscopy and take out the tape but if you are doing a tot tape i am going through areas that i don't have any idea about when you are doing a trans operator sling it looks it is it looks like it's easy to put in but removing it is one of the hardest thing i've been part of three or four surgeries where we try to remove tot tape and it's well known that when you are removing the lateral thigh part of tot you can damage the operator nerve there are a lot of problems that can happen and you can only remove tot in the first month or so after it becomes progressively difficult right whereas a tvt easy i mean i've you know it's so easy to remove it because all of us know how to do it right so do you do tot for all sui patients no you individualize and given uh, the uh, recent evidence coming out and as the editorial uh, in the international urogynecology journal says tvt tape is durable and long standing and the reoperation rate is low also they keep talking of bladder injury bladder injury you know we are needlessly scared of the bladder let me tell you after uh, doing urogyn i realized that is the most forgiving organ you just take catgut sutures on bladder it will heal and come back to you and when you put in a, uh, a retropubic needle uh, along the bladder if you perforate you can stick it out put it back again you can perforate twice and only the third time if you perforate will you stop the surgery right i mean and the uh, the needles that you put in on trans uh, tvt tape are so thin they are malleable they just go in like butter literally so why are we scared and one more thing people talk about voiding dysfunction of a tvd seriously if you look at the evidence yes there is more voiding dysfunction of a tvd than tot but voiding dysfunction that requires treatment is more of a tot please understand that so it's a misnomer to think there is a huge amount of voiding dysfunction and what about the uh, one second huh? sorry 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 i just put out the phone yeah what about the single uh, mini slings etc you know again because I, the, i want to look at the number of years of evidence number of years of evidence is much more for tvt so in uh, you know in evolved over in uh, europe in uk us it's the tvt that's the uh, number one when it comes to surgical treatment but only for severe sui uh, first line treatment mild and moderate biofeedback and electrical stimulation if you can't do pelvic floor muscle strengthening right uh, a mixing condens weaker in sui again the tvt is the king right so yes you, somebody might say fda update right is against mesh no if you look at the fda regulations 2011 later it's against vaginal mesh and prolapse surgery not for sling surgery okay and again current strictures are against tot not retropubic sling surgery so extremely important right it's surgical treatment so you, if you i mean all of us know we're all surgeons right you can't assume we, i have heard certain conference where say do one no sorry something watch one uh you know assist one and do one please do not reduce a sling surgery to that it requires proper training so management of sui requires specialist training it requires proper patient selection it requires proper investigation surgical training and training to handle complication post op care like any other surgery we should not reduce treatments to what we can do we should aspire to rise up to learn the best that we can care, offer to our patients and what is the best that we can offer our patients the best is that you do biofeedback it is absolutely non uh, invasive if it does not work you will go on to transvaginal tape thank you thank you so very much ma'am uh, that was very exciting and that was a really nice talk thank you so much ma'am so i would uh, request now dr savanna 
for the counter and I would request her to share a screen and go ahead with the presentation, please. Good evening, my dear friends. At the outset, I would like to thank my dear friend, Dr. Prativa, for inviting me for this uh, to join this prestigious uh, event and uh, <clears throat> talk on a subject which is very dear to my uh, heart. So uh, I would like to start with something which is not related to the topic. See, debating, I, I am very fond of this debating and on the ninth standard of my school, I was a debate and extension secretary. So I had been joining this debate competition for the whole of my life, I should say from the eighth standard. But this is the first time in my life where my opponent started her opponent, uh, uh, this one opening statement was in favor of my topic, that is non-surgical treatment. Thank you so much, Uparna, for favoring me. Also, one by third of her talk was attributed to my topic, that is non-surgical. Thank you so much. Also, one more thing I would like to add is, Dr. Uh, this one, Dr. Uh, Aparna. So most of the gynecologists and uh, most of the surgeons and the general population have to miss thinking that the non-surgical treatment is only for laser. Okay. I will be talking on the positive sides and what are the distinct good things about a non-surgical treatment. Also, I would like to share, I will be sharing what are the non-surgical techniques. To start with, this is the definition of SUI as per the uh, this thing, uh, I see RCOG when urine leaks out with sudden pressure on the bladder and urethra, causing the sphincter muscles to open briefly. With mild SUI pressure, maybe from sudden forceful activities like exercise, sneezing, laughing, or coughing. The prevalence of uh, SUI worldwide, I'm sharing this because it goes in favor of my talk, in my argument, because the median prevalence of female. Urinary incontinence is 27.6, range is 4.8 to 58.4 as per RCOG. The communist cause is stress. This is 50%. So more than half of the ladies worldwide is suffering from this one in uh, urinary incontinence and half of that is because of stress urinary incontinence. So, so many ladies need the treatment. So. Now again, SY distribution. Now, when we look at the SY distribution of the chart, more than this one, 32 percent is in the age group of 55 to 59. So, when the ladies, when we age it more, when there is around 55 to 59, 59, she may be having other comorbidities. She may not be in a good position to undergo for the surgical procedures. Also, why non-surgical? There may be any health issues. And because there is no anesthesia required in all the non-surgical procedures which we give, and there is psychological issues that nobody wants to go under the knife, even though it's TOT, TBT, they feel we are going to the operation theater and some surgical procedure will be done. Now, correlated concerns like vaginal looseness, which cannot be tackled in complete with the surgical procedure with the TOT or TBT, but vaginal this is also a very important comorbidity which can be tackled with energy-based devices, non-surgical devices. Vulva vaginal atrophy can be tackled. Cost factor, it is cheaper. Now, one of the most important things is universal availability. There is no need for OT setup. It can be given anywhere by some special training and it does not special expertise so that we can give the treatment to all over the women worldwide, either in the urban or in the rural, even though we do not have any OT setup. If we have such an aesthetic setup, I can give, we can give this one, uh, non-surgical treatment. What are the non-surgical treatments? I would like to point out, it is just more than just laser. We have radio frequency that is bipolar, unipolar. We have fractional CO2 laser. We have advium yag. We have diode. We have high fame. Then ultrasound, transurethral RF we have. So this is the uh, studies that I agree with you, Dr. Supana Avana, that we need to look at the evidence base. This is the, the this one uh, study done by me in my center where, where the efficacies of the this one 
uh, bipolar radio frequency, continuous bipolar radio frequency was studied just to see the efficacy for in treating uh, uh, this one uh, uh, incontinence. This is SUI, and we got uh, this result of more than a p value of less than 0.5 percent. So sorry, this is my. Uh, This is a bipolar radio frequency. The bipolar radio frequency probe is attached to the radio frequency machine and is inserted to the vaginal canal. Thereby, we give radio frequency pulse with uh, this is uh, in the all around the vagina to the collagen uh, distinct mucous membrane of the uh, mucosa of the vagina. This is diode, another evidence. Uh, this one energy based device. Diode is, is a clinically proven. With effective results, hygienic prop can be sterilized, fast, homogeneous treatment, painless, clinic based treatment, whereby the diode rays are given in a controlled manner all, about the, all around the vaginal mucosa. We give the energy up to the level of the lamina propria. And there are many studies which say that, which suggest that the diode treatment is uh, this one if, uh, uh, is proven it can be it SUI can be treated with diode treatment many evidence based uh, this one uh, studies are there I could not put more because my dear Pratibha said that I should not uh, in the talk more than seven minutes so it is restricted to only one distinct slide now this is fractional CO2 laser fractional CO2 laser. <laughs> It works in the principle of giving pulse, uh, this one, uh, pulses of uh, laser energy into the collagen of the vaginal wall, thereby giving tissue remodeling and collagen remodeling. Now, again, here we have many evidence based studies which shows that the laser fractional CO2 treatment is. Hello, am I audible? You are, ma'am. Please go on. Oh. There is a high frame. This is high frame chair. High intensity focus electromagnetic web chair, whereby the lady just have to sit on the chair. And the supramaxillary contractions waves are given to the uh, this one uh, with uh, this one pelvic floor muscles. There are many studies which suggest that with a calculated a score of 61%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70 levels of improvement of decreased negative incontinence impact with a p-value of less than 0.001. This is transurethral trans radio frequency device. This is non-surgical outpatient treatment of women with stress urinary incontinence associated with urethral hypermobility, controlled radio frequency energy applied through a transurethral probe hits submucosal tissue to provide collagen denaturation, results in reduced tissue compliance with necrosis. Treatment can be administ administered in 30 minutes under local anesthesia. My conclusion is non-surgical treatment for SUI is equally as effective as surgical, if not more. It is painless, it is office procedure, no anesthesia is required, very less to kneel down time. It tackles other issues like loose vagina and vulvovaginal atrophy at the same time. Improvement of sexual functions is an added uh, distinct for these uh, energy-based devices. There is minimal contraindications. Treatment can be taken at the lady's discretion, which is very, very important because the lady just kind of can come to the OPD and we can just give the treatment. She does not have to tell everybody. She does not have to take permission from any, anybody. It is cost effective. Also, it can be given anywhere, even in the rural area. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
Thank you uh, so very much, uh, ma'am. Uh, so it was an excellent, exciting debate between Dr. Aparna and Dr. Uh, uh, Savanna. Aparna, ma'am, uh, due to positive of time, we'll move on to the judges. Or you want to comment on? Uh, you want to put in some rebuttal comments? One minute. One minute. I'll finish it off. Yes, sure. One minute. One second. Uh, from current slide. Yeah. I don't want to talk about how FDA has come out saying, please do it. I'll, I will do it. You give me evidence. And it can't be individual hospital evidence. It has to be, and given the age of litigation, it has to be Cochrane reviewed. It has to be long-term evidence. I will not go and do something that is invasive. In a, it is invasive. Please, let's not spread. I, in fact, you said I spoke for you. I spoke for you because you, I knew you would not speak of the other right invasive, non-invasive thing. The really non-invasive thing is biofeedback, right? That's why I had to speak here for you, right? And uh, uh, second very important point, expense. Expense, it's 50 lakh machine. There are biofeedback machines available for less than 10 lakhs, 5 lakhs, right? And something that builds our own muscles. We go to the gym every day. Right? Why only for our, uh, you know, arms and legs? Why not for our pelvic floor, which we have got damaged so much because of childbirth? And it will not only help against SUI, it will help against everything. All of us know, right? 90, if you want your pelvic floor to be strong in 90, exercise it. And if it does not work, then surgery. Right? And lastly, even in your... Uh, you know, menopause journal where they spoke about, you know, uh, when FDA came out and talked about safety issues, when the, uh, in the journal of menopause, right, where the committee spoke up in favor of laser, it ended with saying additional randomized well-controlled clinical trials are required to understand even the safety. So please understand that. And why am I saying this? You know, in my fellowship training, seriously, I have come across patients with stenosis of the vagina. Right, I have come up. Uh, see what happens is this, you know, is that when you don't have really standardized how many times you do it, you can end up with stenosis of the vagina. It can end up with fibrosis. The scarring I have seen that, and then you know it's almost like doing agenesis surgery. You know, to open up the vagina to allow her to be sexually active. Seriously, you know, so that after seeing those, it is very imp uh, important for me that I spoke speak for the real non-invasive. And if that fails in only in severe SUI, I'm not saying surgery for mild, moderate SUI. I'm saying for severe SUI, and that's TVT, right? And you said rural India, 50 lakh machine, rural India. Seriously, I mean, I, honestly, the places Marman works, my NGO works, I, I, they don't even have a BP machine. What, will, uh, what can you do without even a BP machine? It's better for muscle strengthening. And if it does not work, surgery, right? Laser will never go 50 lakhs to every nook and corner of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was quite aggressive from uh, both the debaters, I must say. But thank you so much for bringing out the points so very well. So, Surakshit, uh, first your comments, followed by yeah. Emily, yeah. and then we'll take it from Dr. Preeti, please. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic uh, talk, Dr. Aparna, and also Dr. Um, yeah. Savanna. Savanna, right. So, I just wanted to have a few pointers once, Dr. Aparna. Oh, you told me that, you know, Kegels is like the first time treatment. Yes, of course, that is non invasive. And more importantly, what you have to see is you said biofeedback. In fact, the biofeedback when you get from lasers and other EBM devices, you're only talking about lasers. And uh, I don't know what exact laser you're talking about or which has caused vaginal atrophy and things like that. But there are different kinds of lasers. There are also different uh, wavelengths of lasers. So you need to know exactly which laser you're talking about. So definitely all the lasers have their own uses and things. I, for one, am not someone who would say, yes, go for laser therapy or go for, you know, electromagnetic devices or whatever, be it, you know, do whatever works. Yes, definitely Kegels might work in your practice, but we have seen results where not only uh, lasers, but the radio frequencies have their own set of results. Plus also electromagnetic devices do the same thing what you have been talking about. Basically doing Kegels without the effort. You know, you said go, go the extra mile, do the effort. Probably you can use your biofeedback mechanism, ask them to go ahead and use the electromagnetic device and then probably go back and check it and see if in case it gives you a thing. See, the most important biomedical, sorry, the bio mechanical feedback, what we use is the mouth of the patient, you know. If they're going to say that the uh, treatment works, yes, we are happy. And at the end of it, that's more important. I'm more, uh, I'm more uh, attuned to seeing what the patient has to say than what the machine is going to tell me. So that is one thing. The treatment does work. It might have not worked in probably the, the machines which you have seen in the past, but definitely the things and technologies have grown up a lot. 
and uh, another important point i want to bring up is you said you know you are so used to seeing the retrobiopic space i don't think that is true unless you go through laparoscopy you are not going to be able to see the space at all you know open surgeons don't get to see this at all and you know we when we are doing all these uh, when we are doing our post graduations we hardly see the space so it's only now after like years and years of training in laparoscopy we are actually going and doing birch corpus suspensions and you know paravaginal repairs but those were not the case before so definitely the training is not there and um, i believe the other one what you also brought up is um, you know you said there were uh, issues of uh, fda so you are also bringing fda into this picture if you have to also understand johnson and johnson has recalled most of their vaginal meshes why is it so because vagina is yeah just not the tv just not the tv is yes i understand that but what you need to understand is because of the mesh complications and mesh complications are maximum where the infections are and you know the vaginal area is one place where you have maximum chance of infection so if you have an opportunity of making the patient not have this uh, infection why not try it laser is not invasive you don't know which laser you're talking about if you're talking about the co2 I laser know. yeah so so you're talking about the ev uh, the um, which laser are you talking about then the ones which are invasive or the ones which has caused the gel atrophy for comparing the different lasers there is no Sorry? paper comparing the different lasers in fact the uh, general yes, surgeon exactly so exactly the evidence has to that. come if there is a lot of backlash from doctors who are actually stopping the treatment from progressing it is never going to work <laughs> if you want papers to come you need to make the mild moderate sui in severe sui you do surgery in severe sui you are not even doing laser we are not talking about severe sui here you are talking no, about mild and moderate it can be of all kinds exactly we are talking about mild and moderate so in this I situation you need to make works, sure not the skegel biofeedback yeah your biofeedback is what your machine tells you not what the patient says if the patient is going to tell you she is no, going to have a better better patient telling me she gets okay. better after biofeedback yeah, well, the same thing i want to tell you the patient this also uh, yes, uh, feeling yes, better once you do better. the laser treatment or the radio frequency as well as also the uh, uh, you know the electromagnetic devices you know unless you really try them you're not going to know I have so tried if you it. want studies to come yes you need I you need studies to come you have to try it i mean <laughs> and because when you say lasers which are causing atrophy I, my mind was just blown because i have never seen that happening in the recent times at least maybe it was something just happening in the past yes. maybe it was a non fda approved laser because lasers if you are if you are talking about lasers they are fda approved to use on the human body so there is no fda saying that you cannot use lasers at all that is wrong FDA says you can use lasers of course RF is not FDA approved but lasers are FDA approved to use on the human body so definitely we will be able to use them so yeah see whatever be the reason uh, yes definitely i am someone who does birch corpus suspensions myself i am not saying no there is no space for that but what i'm saying is we have to make sure there are enough treatments we need to give them an option if in case kegels don't work you have to go in for the next best treatment you don't just go directly jump to surgery you know it is not the option we give them the Bio option of biofeedback it's not just kegels biofeedback is, bio is just it's something for your satisfaction i don't think biofeedback is for the patient patient uh, has to say yes this is working yeah. that's what's important that is that is biofeedback bio patient's mouth is the biofeedback for me <laughs> not the machine dr yeah. arpana one second dr arpana i had the comparison study but i could not share it because prativa made very sure that 7 minutes 6 minutes and a two for ribo that's why i did not also i did not go i do not favor <laughs> compare and contrast vision i do what um, i is good. Good. Yeah. i don't go in compare and contrast dr priti jindal Dr. Preeti Jindal. Preeti Jindal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Surakshit. Uh, Amili, your comments, please. Yeah. At first, at the outset, I just like to commend both the debaters for a very interesting uh, debate. Um, uh, a few uh, points which both of them brought out well, and then I'll tell you my final uh, what I feel on the issue. So, Dr. Aparna, what she brought out was, you know, uh, uh, she highlighted the importance of uh, Kegels and, of course, biofeedback. is very close to her heart i know that from the talks she's given in cmc also but that is true i think that is an untapped source which we need to look into more at least in setups where you know we may not have everything else so that's a good point she brought out uh, and also um, uh, the role of evidence i'll come to that in my conclusion uh, what dr savana uh, brought out very well was you know how the Uh, energy based devices may be more acceptable for the patient because of cost the taboo of surgery 
uh, you know going under the knife as a woman in india and things like that they may rather just go in for an opd procedure and come once in two months or you know once in four weeks so that she brought out very well um, but finally i think you know before we uh, kind of uh, either propagate or go into any new i mean novel or treatment it's always a mixture of evidence and experience and uh, the thing is the evidence in this if you look at evidence for energy based devices there's a lot of evidence to say that they are effective but there are not many uh, robust trials in terms of case control and randomized control trials with other surgical treatments there are some randomized control trials with say um, energy based devices with vaginal estrogen cream for genito urinary syndrome mild sui and all and they've all proved that they are equally efficacious um so those were there there are some studies on its own to say okay it's with no treatment this is good but you always need to compare before we say that you know this is better than this and sometimes you can't compare because there are it's like comparing a mirena versus a you know a oral drug each of them has their own uh, benefits and the other thing that the ayuga committee actually says you know when since we were talking about the fda Uh, so they actually issued a warning for unsubstantiated advertising and use of energy based devices so that's one thing we should warn against that you know we should use it uh, but the thing is since we are using it this would be an opportunity to do studies with you know collect data and publish our own data so that we can say that you know this may be better or this may be the same and publish the truth so that is required and those studies are still not yet there and until that is there we cannot recommend this as a standard of care versus the other one so that is what i feel and otherwise it will become like the case of as we were talking about the mesh 15 20 years back everybody was putting meshes everywhere and then around 8 to 10 years back we were start taking out all the meshes because of all the complications so that's one thing which is unsubstantiated advertising that word i really like that the fda has put out but not withstanding and not saying that it is totally useless we need to come up with our own uh, evidence is what i feel but it was a very nice uh, debate thank you absolutely thank you so much uh, emily and thank you so much surakshit and uh, if uh, dr preeti chindal ma'am uh, your comments please I think I just saw Preeti Ma'am leave, so I think I, uh, there was a problem with her uh, unmuting uh, thing or a signal issue. So uh, excellent debate, I must say, Doctor Aparna, Doctor Savanna, in good spirit, and of course Surakshit and uh, Emily beautifully summed up the debate, the beautiful points that were brought out. So thank you so much. Of course, at the end of the debate, it's the key take-home messages that we look at, and of course the key take-home messages are: do what is best at your place, best resource that is available for your patient. do not overdo anything and not all fingers are of equal size so it's to be substantiated and to be taken it as what suits your patient the best so i think that is what the message i think that should be given forward to all the viewers present here thank you so much uh, the debaters and the chair the judges and also dr preeti for being there for so long as though she could not come in over here so next we will have a poll uh, that uh, is going to happen and let's see what uh, our viewers have learned from whatever we have discussed today so can i have the poll question please support yeah so this is let's get the answer from our straight from our audience what is your preference for managing sui is it surgical or non surgical you get 30 seconds so please start uh, voting and we'll get the answer at the hello? end of 30 seconds hello we are no no we ma'am please please mute yourself three minutes ma'am Can you please put up the poll question? Support. Yeah. So we have another question, which is genital urinary. No. Another question. This is not the question. Just yeah. The poll question, please. Question. Poll question, please. Hello.
I think they have done the poll question before. Yes. So I think the poll is already done, madam. Yeah. Poll question. You have to answer, please. Okay. Yeah. So the preference for managing SUI is non-surgical. Absolutely, uh, uh, that's eighty-three percent. That's the majority. But then, yeah, as both of our debaters have said, surgical is only for severe symptoms, and otherwise, it's non-surgical that is to be preferred. So basically, the point that both the debaters have put across has been taken quite well by the audience. So thank you so much. Dr. Dr. Priyanku, Dr. Preeti Jindal has joined. She wants to speak actually. Yes, sure, yeah. sure. Preeti, Preeti ma'am, your comments, please. Dr. Preeti? Dr. Preeti? Ma'am, I don't see her in the. I don't she see her there, in the. She's there, she's there, but hello. Dr. Preeti? Okay. Maybe we can take her comments at the end of the talk once she joins. Yes, yes, yeah. So, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful debate. Now, I would like to uh, the support. Can I have the CVs, please? The most exciting and the most awaited session of the evening. The talk by Dr. Naren Malodra, sir. Support. Can I have the CVs, please? Hello, CV. Hello. Okay. So I would like to introduce the chairpersons for the session first. Dr. Chitra TV Ma'am, she's a professor and unit chief of obstetrics and gynecology at the prestigious PhD Medical College in Coimbatore. She is the president of the Kovai Obijibayan Society, member of Ayuga and ISUOG, and also a scientific committee member of UFOXI 2019. Welcome, ma'am, uh, to this platform. I would also like to welcome the second chairperson. Can I have the slide, please? Hello. Hello. Yeah, it is Dr. N. Sumati, professor. Hello, Dr. Priyankur. So, I will I will introduce Dr. Sumati. She is the professor and head of department of Ops and Gyne in Rajaji Hospital, Madurai. And she is at present she is the president of Coimbatore uh, 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 Ops and Gyne Society. So, I welcome Dr. Uh, uh, Sumati, and I'll request Dr. Sumati to kindly introduce our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Naren Malhotra. Yes. Can I have the CV of Dr. Narendra? Yeah. Dr. Sumati. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Pratipa for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the CME. And it is a really great privilege to introduce Professor Narendra Matota, sir. He's Managing Director, Global Rainbow Healthcare and Director, ART Rainbow and IVF Center and President in SARG and Vice President, SA4G and WPM. And also past president Izar, ISPA, and IF MUD, Foxy, AOGS, and also he is the director of the School of Ultrasound and a professor, School of Science and Technology, Croatia, and professor, International University, Croatia, and founder editor of the SAFOG Journal, and member of FIGO Guidelines Committee 2014 to 17, and director of Manita CSC, and also chairman Smriti. New level of care and president Rotary Club Agra Park City. And his advisor to Maulana Azad Medical College and Ariga and SMS Medical College Jaipur. And he's presented over 125 papers and the chapters published. And also over 1,000 guest lectures he has given in India and abroad and 38 orations. And the editor for 41 books, many chapters on editorial board of many journals, and editor of series of step-by-step -step books and revising editor Jeffco, as well as revising editor Donald Obstetric Manual and revising editor Foxy's Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And he received so many awards, Corona Warrior Awards to Ethicon Fellowship. And uh, it is very nice to introduce you, sir. And over to Dr. Narendra Malhotra, sir, for this talk. 
Thank you, thank you, Shruti. Thank you very much for this kind words of introduction. Uh, can I share my slides? Can, can you remove this? Support. It's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, debate which we have had. And uh, of course, there is anything new is going to be taken with a pinch of salt. When IVF came, Patrick Steptoe and uh, Robert Edwards were put into jail for doing something which is unethical. And they said, you're making babies outside the human body. Can you remove the CV, please, someone, so I can share my slides? So that is, uh, that is uh, what uh, new, new thing generates a heated debate, and uh, it always uh, gets great minds to think better and to come out with more and more new things. So what I'm going to take you through is what is aesthetic and regenerative gynecology, and does countries like India and developing countries need aesthetic and regenerative gynecology. And as uh, Dr. Ragni had said, it's not only cosmetics, or it's not only aesthetics, it's regenerative, it's actually functional. And the need of aesthetic gynecology in developing countries is increasing day by day. And we have the European Society where you saw Alex Bader, and Alex Bader did con uh, conduct the first training workshop in India at this hospital in Agra with us. And that is where we launched the Indian Society of Aesthetic and uh, Regenerative Gynecology, uh, which we thought is much more needed to address these issues. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, uh, the machines and equipment which I'll be mentioning and showing, none of them have supported me financially or any way else. So it's, it's uh, just my own presentation and my own personal experiences and pictures. You will see a lot of them are my are own from our Agra hospital and some of them shared by the European Society of Aesthetic and Regenerative Gynecology, which are being acknowledged on the slide. So in India, we never acknowledge it as a problem. And uh, it is not uncommon today to that women, we come across women and, and couples who are very dissatisfied, male and female both, with the appearance of genitalia. It was the male who was usually coming forward um, with the complaints of smallness, largeness, curves, penis, and all that. But so recently, we are seeing a lot of women coming, coming forward to, to us with some uh, of these problems. And it is not uncommon to see that women dribble your drops of urine and have urgency and frequency and they leak. And they don't tell. So it is her unspoken problems which we are dealing with. And it is also not uncommon that women come with severe vulval pain, dryness and discharge, which does not get treated by anything else, anything. Or whatever medicines you call, uh, give, it doesn't get treated. And it's also not uncommon to come across a woman and a couple who are very dissatisfied sexually because of the vaginal laxity. And it's also not uncommon to receive requests during deliveries to put an extra stitch and make me as tight as I was before. So it is there. So it is the developing world, our world is shy. And this book of Mahindra Watt says it's normal. And a well-known sexual expert just deals with the women and men problem of why, they, why we are shy. We are shy because it, the girls were brought up not discussing about the genitalia, which is a big taboo. And anything, any complaint, like leaking a few drops of urine or tightness or looseness, it's, it's not is the answer. And girls and women are not encouraged to discuss this. So you have to bring out the problem by questioning them. And what is this her unspoken problems? The pelvic organ prolapse, symptomatic or asymptomatic, urinary dysfunction, stress urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunctions, overactive bladders, fecal incontinence, pelvic pain, vulval pain, vaginal pain, vaginal vulval itching, and abnormal discharge, and a lot of local vaginal uh, and vulval symptoms. And even for that matter, discoloration of the vulval areas and all that. So a new speciality has emerged, and that speciality world over is known as female pelvic medicine, reconstructive surgery med uh, department and cosmetic and aesthetic gynecology. And we had, have the most uh, important European Society of Aesthetic Gynecology, and we have the American Society of Aesthetic Gynecology, and we are now have the World Society. And in India, we have our INSAR, the Indian Society of Aesthetic and Regenerative Gynecology, 
which will deal with these new specialities. What does this new speciality will deal with? When uh, this is a survey which uh, uh, was published, 64% rural or urban women will complain of vaginal laxity if they are questioned. 30% urban and 10% rural will complain of change in sexual pleasure after deliveries. And unattractive gaping introitus, 48% of women, you won't believe. If you ask them, are you happy with your external genitalia appearance? A lot of them are not happy, almost 50%. And do you need a change? If that question was asked, 33% want a change in the external genitalia, uh, especially in urban women, because of the tight clothes they're wearing. So they don't want the labia majora to be shining through the tight clothes. And that is a major, major request by models and by young girls today. So what we can do is we can do in this, under this um, association, under this new, uh, new uh, speciality, vaginal tightening, post-delivery rehabilitation, SUI, mild and moderate management, vaginal dryness, vulval rejuvenation, deal with the scars anywhere over the body, vulvodynia, which we have no treatment, Vestibular dynia, which we have no treatment, lichen sclerosis, leukoplakias, vaginal infections, bleaching, coloration, all that can be dealt with as her unspoken problems, if you ask her. So another survey which we did was 104 women attending a routine gynecological checkup with an average age of 55 were questioned about the sexual function and the measurement of the vaginal length and caliber. And 73 of these 104 were sexually active at 55, and 30 of them complained of dyspareunia vaginal dryness. And vaginal anatomy, no different between women not sexually active or active, and no sexual difficulties were complained of, but they were there. Then in India, we have, uh, because they say, why we don't need these things in India? Why, why do we need? Our women are very, very, and they, they will uh, accept what it is as it is. It's not true. 26 million births, 60% vaginal deliveries. All these percentage of women will have perennial laxity after deliveries. And some degree of urinary incontinence after post-delivery is about 20%. And also prolapse. And these problems cannot be ignored and cannot be ignored and must be brought out. And our own Indian Journal of Community Medicine has published a comparison of sexual outcomes in primipara experiencing Vaginal, between vaginal and uh, cesarean deliveries. And you, you see that there is a big percentage of sexual dysfunction, vaginal looseness to the tune of 55 to almost 80% loss of libido and things like that uh, in uh, post-vaginal delivery. We also forget that about 15 to 25% of women are PCOS. And what do we do? PCOS girls, what do you do? You get a scan done and you get a hormone done, and that's it. We never look at the external genitalia. They may be having androgenic uh, enlarged clitoris. So if you look for all these girls, you will not be surprised to find a, a problem like this also in young girls. And this also comes under her unspoken problem. She doesn't know this young girl of 14, 15 doesn't know what it is, but then it comes, comes because of the high androgens. And then, of course, we have the GSM, the geriatric uh, population, which is increasing day by day, and peri- and postmenopausal population. And there is nothing called as geriatric medicine and sexual problems after menopause or lifetime. You attain 55. What do you need to do sex for? 60? Absolutely no. 70? Why? And that is the question. Why not is my answer. So most of the women land up to do the gynecologist, and these gynecologists are busy delivering babies, busy tackling AUBs, busy doing hysterectomies. They do not have time to listen to these menopausal or unspoken problems. And they say, to hota hi hai. this is normal, and you please live it. You have another five or 10 years to live. You just live it. So the quality of life suffers uh, in this woman if we don't pay attention to them and don't tackle this, these problems by a specialist. And the magnitude of problem may be just a simple cystocele or a rectocele or an enterocele or even a first or a second degree prolapse or just an elongation of the cervix. All this need treatment. All this need treatment. I'm not talking about um, treatment um, 
non-invasive or invasive, we, we're going to treat them whichever way and whichever method we find best uh, to treat them. So the postmenopausal genetic urinary syndrome of menopause, GSM, is a uh, problem and women are going to live 20 years in this phase of life, maybe 30. So what uh, Dr. Sheila said, fit and uh, good looking at 70 and, and 80 and, and very uh, good at 90, I would say they, they may be living uh, 100 in, in recent uh, after, after a few years, because we, we, if we, as soon as we conquer aging. So let's see one by one the problems. And we had a lovely debate on SUI. And it, the incontinence could be SUI, could be urge, could be mixed, could be overflow, could be atypical. And it all gets mixed in women. So you're, you, sometimes you do not know a true stress urinary incontinence to an urge or anything. What we know is they, they have an urgency, they have a frequency. They have enuresis and they have dysuria. If you ask them, one of these four things, uh, all, almost 80% women in menopause will complain. And this could be because of just simple urinary tract infections, stones, urinary tract fistulas, diverticular, and neuromuscular problems. So we need to look at them. We, need, we just can't say it's normal and you live at it. And of course, the pelvic support problems, which is the more common at, the, at this stage. So, uh, as uh, Aparna said, lifestyle changes, bladder training, physical therapy, pessary treatments, bulk, bulking agents, surgery is the answer which we have. And today we have a new option on energy based devices, what we call as laser rejuvenation. And it could be any type of laser, which is a good quality FDA approved laser machine and not the cheaper Chinese models, which are now available, which are not standardized. So if you're going to use laser, use a standardized laser and not, uh, not a cheap one, which is available. What about Kegel exercise? And Aparna was very, very forceful on Kegel exercise. No, no woman can do a proper Kegel exercise because you don't know how to train them to do a proper Kegel exercise because they don't know what muscle to, uh, to uh, massage at and how to how tightly so you have the biofeedback me mechanism very good but still you have to tell them to lie down in a particular position tighten loosen tighten loosen 20 times 200 times 500 times but we have kegel masters available so we have this simple device battery operated goes into the vagina and it massages the areas or the muscles which you want to and that is a kegel master it is freely available on amazon and then according to your biofeedback or according to your requirement, you can go and ahead and advise, which will be simple. What about surgeries? We have vaginal surgeries, abdominal surgeries, urethral surgeries, and laparoscopic surgeries, suspensions, flings, Bush, MMK, posterior repair, and MUS and everything. So these uh, surgeries are uh, with tapes and all. And as you heard, that tape surgery went into dispute. So the laparoscopic surgery came in and laparoscopic, you put the ports in and put the tape correctly, rightly. Yes, if it is severe SUI and there is not responding, you, you could be doing some surgeries like that. But with tension-free vaginal tapes, the cure rate, could be as high as 60 to 90, but there are primary failed surgeries and there are uh, complications which are there, bladder perforation. Uh, one or two times bladder perforation, do the third time. I mean, it's easier said than done. And go into the rectal space, easier said than done. We are not trained to look into the rectal spaces and we know So it could lead to urgency and retention, all that. So it, if surgery has to be done, it has to be a very good expert. What simply can be done is the periurethral injections here through outside, through the vagina or through the hysteroscope also, the transurethral, cystoscope, sorry. And that is where you strengthen the bladder neck and that you improve the SUI. But implants, surgeries, everything has its own complications. And it could be to the tune of 12%, which is quite high and could be injuries, voiding, bladder perforations, pelvic visceral injuries, 
hemorrhage inside, mesh erosion, extrusion, urinary tract infections, groin pain, dyspareunia, and these are uh, these are problems. Then over the last 10 to 15 years, as the color of the leaves changes, something has changed to make women and girls more aware of the appearance of the genite. And it's mainly wearing skin tight clothes. And if they have a labia majora like this, that's going to shine through the thin sign, see through clothes which they wear when they walk up and things. So this has started a new demand of surgery or a female cosmetic gynecological surgeries, aesthetic surgery. Also in India, premarital sex is a taboo, but a lot of girls are sexually active and they've come for re-virginization. So if they want a re-virginization, what is the harm? You, you can do it simply, please do it. Also, vaginal laxity is poorly understood in the urban world. This will come up only when you question the woman about vaginal laxity. They might not come or the husband might come. So female cos uh, genetic cosmetic surgery is controversial as of now. Involves a lot of them, which could be vaginal rejuvenation, labioplasty is the labia which I showed you, vulvar uh, liposculpturing, if you have a thick uh, vulva, uh, external or mons pubis, you can make, uh, do a liposuction there and uh, reshape the pubis, uh, mons pubis and the uh, vulva, uh, labia majora and all. Of course, hymenoplasties and G-spot uh, uh, amplification also. These also come into this. So again, uh, the list is endless. The lead need is real. And the needs respect, uh, need to be respected because women have a choice of their own. They have to think. And it, if she wants this, and if we can give it without causing harm, we should give it. Why should she suffer in silence? 50% of our population suffers in silence uh, is, is too much. So what all we can do by, uh, which comes under this branch is vaginal atrophy. So what treatment do you have for this? You will give some creams, some estrogen creams, temporary relief, that's it. What, what are the symptoms? What is uh, what this, these things, atrophic vagin vulvitis, vaginitis does not get treated by creams or anything. And this keeps on coming back and back with frequency pain and the patient comes and runs from doctor to doctor and finally, is so frustrated with her family life and her personal life that they, some, some of them are on the verge of dying. So what we have to and to have a regular, but if they're in pain and if they're in despair, how can they have a regular sexual activity? So we need to understand that also. So we need to do something to, so they can resume their normal activity. So this could occur in prepubertal women, could occur in postmenopausal women, where the androgen, um, the estrogen is less, and the ep vaginal epithelium is now very friable, more pro so that is where we need to do something. And, uh, or it could be just this, repeated infections coming in, repeated bartholinitis, uh, coming in, this is the fourth or the fifth time till you can surgically remove it and then do a laser on that and inject PRP and rejuvenate and regenerate normal tissues. That is what we're going to try for doing abnormal vaginal discharges, pruritus, irritation, burning. So it's just not cosmetic. It is, it is functional. It is a real problem which we have. So the treatment for atrophic vaginitis to every gynecologist is estrogen, progesterone, estrogen cream and all that and lubricants, but we, we can offer her much more. And the offer the female cosmetic gynecological surgeon would offer many, many treatments for the labia, for the vagina, for reshaping, for hymenoplasties and for G. I am not saying that these are risk-free treatments. They have their own risks because they are surgical and they are non-surgical also, both. So we can do them non-surgically and we can use the same laser, laser to do them surgically, also correct them surgically. So let's see what, what, what can be done and how. So this was a woman who was unhappy with this and this was the after. 
surgery, labioplasty, done by CO2 laser and uh, first drawn. So we have to reshape so we don't botch up the surgery and she does not land up for a second surgery. Uh, designer, people want a, uh, a different shape of vulva vagina. They want the clitoral to be unhooded. They want augmentation labioplasty, where these uh, labia are very thin. They want an augmentation of the mons pubis, or they want a liposuction of the mons pubis and liposuction of the vulva. Again, can be offered and can, comes under this. So these are our friend, Dr. Laura, shared these with me. And thank you, Laura, for doing this. If you're listening to this, the, the link has gone to her. Uh, Self-conscious about a lab labia, preventing sexual re uh, uh, relationships. This is what happened after that. Very, very unhappy with the labia. Uh, both of them, both partners, very unhappy, could not have good sexual intercourse because the labia were interfering in it. And this is what uh, happens after you do a surgical laser. So surgical vaginoplasty, vulvoplasty, labioplasty is done again by laser cutting. And that is what I'm stressing on. If you have a device, which should be doing all of these things. So, or you can do it as you do with your knife and cautery and then put in a lot of stitches where the disadvantage would be bleeding, injury, infections, scarring, narrowing, and all that. We were taught to give a transverse incision and transverse tighten it, a longitudinal incision and transverse to loosen the vagina. That, those were the vaginoplasty. Now, this girl came to me diagnosed as a pinhole and somebody said it is actually pinhole cervix. Because they had with pressure built up a whole new vagina posteriorly. So they were not having sexual dis dysfunction. Only when infertility came, they came. So there was a small hole and we just expanded that and just made crochet incisions with the cutting laser and no stitches. And that's how good the whole thing was. And we saw the cervix inside. This one is my most recent one, discovered at the time of vaginal delivery. She never came out with a problem. We also never saw her where when we did a pelvic examination just prior to delivery uh, for uh, pelvis assessment, that, that's when we noticed that she has a severe leukoplakia and a benign uh, lichen player, uh, planus like disease. Just post delivery, she came, she said, when I was stitching the episiotomy, can you remove these for me? Well, we will, but not immediately. We will do this by surface laser or what we call as Femi light and Femi this thing. And we'll just show you how, how we can do it. We'll do it. And she has taken the rejuvenation package. So three months after delivery, she'll have a vaginal uh, tightening laser or a vaginal rejuvenation and the surface laser to um, treat this problem. Who should be doing it is the big question. Should gynecologists be providing cosmetic? Should plastic surgeons be doing it? Should general physicians be doing it? Should anyone, any surgeon be doing it? Well, whoever is trained specially in this speciality should be doing it. That's why we have started the training. And you can get this training with uh, in Chandigarh, in Gurgaon, and in Agra with us, the three places. And I think also with Shurakshit in Chennai and with some people in Kolkata also. That's where we have. So let's come to energy-based devices. And energy-based devices, my favorite is the fractionated CO2 laser, a robotic one, automatically rejuvenates all rotates inside, measures the length of the vagina, and automatically will go in. And three sittings, four weeks apart, of five passes. We do five. It is recommended to do minimum three. We have started doing five since we did the workshop with Dr. Badr and um, others. Uh, and with Dr. Robin uh, in Agra. We can also amplify the G-spot. You identify the G-spot by putting a finger in and sliding it slowly outside to the urethra and ask the woman to say where she feels the maximum sensation. So that spot can be amplified by doing a laser in that area or injecting PRP or injecting now, hyaluronic acid injection in this area is very, very uh, richly supplied by capillaries, and we don't want it to leak into the circulation. So that is that, that thing. What about VRS? As I said, with all normal vaginal deliveries, we offer a VRS uh, management uh, package. Three months later, they come for a 
vaginal uh, laser to one or two sittings because most of them as i showed you in the first slide in the in the survey show the 56% will have sexual dysfunction 20 to 30% have urinary incontinence and urogenital syndrome they land up in menopause and this will lead to conditions like that in the bedroom and uh, which will cause great marital problems also the vulval pain and the vulvodynia causes problems like that and you will be surprised this 1 million cases per year of all ages who are hypersensitive to touch on their vulva for unexplained reason no treatment when i was a postgraduate in my in aligarh medical college my professor professor kusum sikshana said we we did a we presented a paper at that time 1986 85 i think and she would put this is the vulva she would put deep longitudinal incision on both sides of the labia cutting all the nerves to the labia gruesome 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 operation uh, you need not do all that for this pain so what do we, what using both it's a non invasive measure it's uh, we are using the fractionated one so one laser beam is fractionated into 81 laser beams small small laser beams and the probe is inserted into the vagina and the probe rotates 360 degrees if you want to do sui it rotates only on the office settings and internal and it is automatic the probe will go in come out one go in come out and i'll try if my video works i'll shift radio frequency is also equally good but the only problem with radio frequencies the probe has to be changed every time it's one time one use so it's it's a little expensive to run the machine may be cheaper but the patient has to pay about 25000 rupees for the probe also so hence we use reuse with only and this is given to the patient for our experience that will be coming out any time uh, even in stress incontinence and then we will have some indian evidence uh, which we have and i think with preeti i have also done a multi centric study with preeti jindal and that will also come out very soon in one of the journals so we will have some indian results what laser does inside the vagina is you see 81 spots these micro 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 holes in the vagina no bleeding it goes 6 mm no blood vessels there it causes aseptic injury to the collagen deep below the epithelium so collagen it's what we call as a deep aseptic wound and that will remodel the collagen in one month and after one month you repeat again so remodeled again one month you repeat again three sittings the collagen is remodeled molded and the patient feel so these are the micro holes we did a colposcopy immediately after now additionally so the pr goes enters the holes and causes better healing so our study with laser uh, vaginal rejuvenation with prp is also almost complete and i think will be published by, should be ready by the end of this year what is our protocol we have the family probe we have the plastic dilators and we have the covers and we use three to five passes five passes introitus uh, the in energy inside can go up to 80 100 outermost energy is kept low and in two years we have done 156 suis 70 vaginal tightening 27 grade one prolapse 17 watts nine shaping reshaping nine lichen like lesions vulval tightening vaginal dryness and the others so this is our own results our experience the need is real and some of our cases this patient uh, husband was very very unhappy with the gaping vagina and with the surface she's just un, uh, done her second sitting the and it is the the vaginal is also improved a little bit tighter but by the end of three sittings it's going to improve much more and the skin will lighten up and the wrinkles are gone from the skin one or two are left and these will go by the third sitting also so that's what we and this is how we do it we have the femi tight probe 
which is go on the surface, remove all the wrinkles and tighten the outer skin. And we have the light pro light scan, which will lighten the colors. So a dark vulva, people not happy with it, can have. See, this is this is on the skin. You all women probably have undergone a laser facial one time or the other to uh, to lighten their skin. It's the same thing. It's the same laser machine. It's a similar laser machine which you use on the face, on the breast for breast tightening, on the abdominal wall for abdominal tightening, removal of the post-pregnancy scars or any of the, uh, the others. So yes, other devices for SUI, Kegel meter. So you get the proper Kegel exercise. The biofeedback mechanism, uh, which Aparna so stressed and swears by it. The MCLA chair, women can sit. It's known as a Kegel throne. So they just come and sit on the chair, read a newspaper for half an hour in your clinic and listen to some music and watch a movie and go back. So the Kegel exercise is done in the clinic, possibly by the MCLA chair. We also have the non gynec uses for women. So pregnancy stare, stretch marks by all the energy-based devices, facial laser for facial skin tightening, removing of crow's feet and removing of bags under the eyes, warts anywhere, dark spots and moles anywhere, scar marks and post cesarean keloids. There are evolving derma indications and cosmetic indications. But again, the dermatologist and the cosmetologist, women, we should be looking after our women. So it comes under the purview of the gynecologist. Breast tightening, breast skin tightening, and even abdominal wall tightening also is being tried. And of course, we have in this laser, we have the knife. So anything which we cut now, we're doing the cesarean skin cutting also by the laser knife, the CO2 laser knife. What about the developing countries? Developing countries all have a huge rural urban divide. You see, these are the three rural women, and you see how urbanized the younger one has become and how urbanized the other two want to become by looking at the laptops and all. So they also have their right to enjoy their reproductive life and they have a right to have their sexual gratification and they have also the right to be offered all this. There is this huge, beautiful painting. Now, a lot of people ask, what is a good looking vulva or a, a, a bad looking vulva? So there is something may look good to anyone and something may look bad to anyone. It's like your nose, long nose may look, some may look good. The thin lips look good on some, fat lips look good on someone. So it's your body. So that, from all this, the great vaginal wall was made. And this great vaginal wall shows the different type of vulval shapes which are there. And if the patient comes to us not happy with the shape, we show her this and ask her, what, what do you want? And we could try to reconstruct that for her. So the pros and cons have to be explained. When you search for designer vagina, in Google, you find 100 on laser labia. But when you search for designer vagina, you find laser labial on Google, PubMed. So the Google search, this many papers have to come on PubMed. So PubMed only has 33 items found, while a Google has 378 of them and 37,000. So once all these studies which are there on Google come on PubMed, all the debates which happened before will go away. Then the WHO has a definition of genital mutilation. Anything cut on the vagina, vulva is genital mutilation. So that's a very thin gray line, which we all cosmetic genital uh, surgeons are walking on. Now, can this be a genital mut mutilation? She had a vulva like this, we made it like this. Is it genital mutilation or not is the thin line. And that is where your ethics committee and so the 10 points on aesthetic gynecology should we be doing or not? Let's go from below. If it is not medically indicated, don't do it. If it is not proven side effect is a myth now. Women are not educated on the normal. They say that is normal. So that is a myth now. Women are requesting for the procedure. Yes, they have a right to request for the procedure because they want to improve their self-image. They want to be better. Doctors are promoting it as unrealistic ideal. Yes. In American, any women's magazine, you will see huge number of ads. I'm sorry, I don't have that picture. Or come 15 minutes, we will rechange your shape, we'll tighten you up, we'll make you a virgin. All those sorts of advertisements should be banned. 
that is exactly what FDA has done. FDA has not banned the procedure, they banned the advertising. It's right to demand and any new treatment with expensive machines is costly. It is unethical. No, it is not unethical. Women are being forced by social pressures. Whatever social pressures are what, if a woman wants, if she wants to reshape her nose, it is allowed. Huh? If she wants to breast uh, and uh, enlarge the breast silicone, it is allowed. Huh? And if she wants to get the fat removed, it's allowed. So why not this? And of course, seminars offer industries uh, secrets for a high rate. Absolutely no. Now, AOCOG also and all, all the associations also support it. And in uh, Foxy also, we're going to come out with a, a statement. So female cosmetic gynecological surgery is coming up and is coming up and, and two studies, one observational and one our cases. And I have already sent you this uh, 65. And we have a huge Indian experience on it. Compared to surgeries, we don't have comparison with tapes because they're almost given up. We have non-operative energy-based devices now being compared to each other. Yes, we have all that. Do Asian women in developing countries, they, they need it. Women have the right to decide. It's Women's Day. Happy Women's Day to all of you women who are watching this. It is your right to demand and it is our right uh, for doctors who are trained in it not to refuse it. So if you want to good look, look good on your face, on your breast, on your abdomen, on your hips, you have a right to go to undergo all the cosmetic procedures which are safely offered. Obviously, trained gynecologists, trained urologists, trained urogynecologists, and trained plastic surgeons should be doing it. And it should not be a hit and trial method. Laser, buy a laser machine and start doing it? Absolutely no. There is a mushrooming. So there is going to there is like there is a mushrooming of every new thing. There was a mushrooming of IVF since the Chinese machines have become very cheap. So there's going to be great mushroom mushrooming out there. So female genital cosmetic surgery is an infant stage in our country, but energy-based devices have also come in, and energy-based devices will replace a lot of genital surgery uh, for a lot of things, especially mild and moderate SUIs and mild and moderate. So aesthetic gynecology is a relatively a new branch, and this was two. Or this was the founder of it, a French, Belgian, and Italian dermatologist. They were cruising on the Mediterranean, and they've just met. And these three friends gave rise to the aesthetic gynecology branch. So there are always going to be a dilemma of technology plus fashion, Hippocrates oath versus appearance. Thank you very much. There's no such thing as perfect or complete. And me, Dr. Ragni, Dr. Jaydeep, Dr. Leela Vyas, and Preeti Jindal bring you greetings from INSAR and urge you all to join this association so that you can be a part of this new revolution, a new super speciality in the field of gynecology. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such wonderful talk. Now I'll request Dr. Chitra to give her views. Dr. Chitra. Uh, at the outset, let me congratulate you, sir, for having uh, spoken so well about something which is very, very new. It's really an upcoming branch, this uh, aesthetic gynecology. And I must tell you, it was an eye-opener. Because we still uh, see some patients coming to us with this. Ten years ago, I had a patient who was relatively young. She was only around 32. She said, I'm going for a holiday. I would like to surprise my husband. What did she want? She wanted a vaginal tightening. She was only 32. I was actually surprised by it. Ten years ago, uh, with the very fact that she asked me, she was a very close friend of mine. In spite of it, I was wondering why does she want it at all? But now I feel that it's not uncommon. We see so many patients coming to us asking for this. Two days ago, I had a patient who was 60 years. She said, husband is a major. And then she said, my vagina is very loose. Please do something. I wanted to be tightened. She was actually paranoid. She went on asking every day. She used to come to my clinic and say, please do something. Please do something. 
so uh, people are coming out with this problem and we have to offer them something like you said it is not uncommon in our country just because our country is uh, developing it doesn't mean that people don't have this problem it is important that all of us uh, know all these things at least if you're not able to do it ourselves it's important that we're able to refer them to the correct center where they will be able to get some help and uh, it uh, causes so much of sexual disharmony there might be with uh, lots of uh, i mean the separations etc can happen so it's important that we know all those things so like what sir said it is very important it is just not cosmetic but it is also regeneration and sexual it's not important that we go on adding life to our patients uh, life expertise is becoming more and more it is important that you see how they live you have to add uh, life to them and just not years to them um, so uh, it's important that we know that it's only not cosmetic but also regenerative and like sir said there are many things that patients can be offered to vaginal tightening that's one of the most important things they come to us with and the incontinence uh, that's the second thing and uh, people the other thing that they come to us with this um, uh, not able to have sexual arousal i'm sure if you can do the g spot uh, amplification that might really help them so there are many uh, things that we can offer to these patients it's important that we able to guide them properly thank you very very much it was really wonderful to listening to you sir, sir thank you so much it was very nice and it is nice that we uh, heard you coming from the dogs smooth from so you really uh, know that you have really done those things and we could uh, share it with our patients thank you so much and i would uh, like to thank the uh, madam for having given us this opportunity it's a really wonderful people will not come out with this because they think it's a taboo but uh, we have to encourage them all the sexual uh, uh, problems um i mean they it is their right young people age is no bar we have to deal with all these situations thank you so much ma'am yeah thank you thank you dr chitra yes sir it's a great doctor yes yes request dr sumati dr sumati if you want to it's add it's a great talk yes ma'am it is a great talk really it is uh, quite interesting for us to know almost uh, all will be benefited from our uh, society so thank you sir Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumati, and uh, thank you, sir, for taking thank us you. through thank a full you. journey of aesthetic gynecology and changing our concept to this unspoken problem of a female. Because many a times we get such patients, but uh, they want to tell also, but we don't keep eye on that, and we don't uh, hear that these these problems because normally we feel that this is not. Uh, what they have to do now so now we will be having a totally different concept about this and thank you sir for such wonderful talk and uh, i really want to thank you for joining and just join just wait for a few minutes also sir we will be coming with one surprise question also so i'll request the support to put a surprise I'm question yeah i'll we have a surprise question after this and the person who will uh answer first will get a book by dr narend malotra so i'll request support to kindly put that book in front hello hello mr saurabh so you can see this is the book which we will be giving to the person who is going to answer the question first that is fibroids by dr narend malotra and uh, now the question will come and this will be the certificate of appreciation so now i will request to put the question surprise quiz question and it has four answers so this is the question that genito urinary syndrome of a menopause includes all except urinary frequency and urgency genital prolapse vaginal laxity and clitoral hood reduction so now your time starts now so start answering this is the question for viewers kindly answer and win that book
the answer to this question will be i mean the will be told in the next uh, next webinar when we'll be having the next webinar on 18th on that day the winner name will be announced hello yeah i think they have registered the answers and uh, the answer is i request dr naren malhotra to give the answer sir i will request you to give the answer sir <laughs> please unmute yourself sir please unmute yourself please unmute dr naren malhotra i'll request host to kindly unmute dr naren malhotra hello mr sarab kindly unmute dr naren malhotra any anyway the answer is d i think sir will listen answer is d just give your hand and tell me is the answer is d okay the answer is d so thank you so much yes sir now you can speak sir because uh, clitoral hood reduction clitoral hood reduction is not in the menopausal syndrome it's the other ones are all a part of menopausal syndrome clitoral hood reduction is only for sexual gratification for those who have a who have a tunga hood or who want it uncovered for extra gratification so thank you sir thank you sir so much and uh, now i will uh, give my vote of thanks so my sincere thanks starts right from our viewers for watching this web series making it so popular and i am really indebted to our chief guest dr uh, jaydeep malhotra ma'am for sparing her precious time and sharing the valuable thoughts with us which will always inspire us and i also want to thank uh, dr rashni agarwal ma'am for accepting this invitation and bringing and uh, being there throughout the she was there throughout the program so thank you so much madam my special thanks goes to dr sheela mane ma'am for her graceful presence my sincere thanks to dr naren malhotra sir for such wonderful and such thought provoking talk today thank you sir for everything from the core of my heart i would like to thank our chairperson judges and expert dr chitra dr sumati dr surakshit dr emily and dr preeti jindal i think her net was not uh, very stable so she could not talk but she was very keen to tell so many things about that maybe next time we'll include her for share for this now my applause goes to dr shavana and dr aparna for making debate so interesting and thought provoking she has they have made really changed so much so many concept so it is very important that we should be changing we should know how to change ourselves that is very important so thank you so much and uh, it was a great debate and finally i would like to acknowledge the sincere involvement and support by our anchor dr priyankur roy for conducting this program so thank you dr priyankur and lastly i would like to appreciate shield connect for their background help and support thanks mr saurabh and his team now we'll be coming up again with the next series shortly till then goodbye and good night thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am thank you once again thank you naren sir thank you all faculty members thank you all audience this great you, presentation excellent talk by and we are getting so many